Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to our first InfoBIP North America webinar. And I'm going to hand over the introductions to the Director of Marketing North America, Jeff Swan. Everyone, uh, thanks for joining today. Um, we have a great program for you. Uh, with our, where our special guest Chris Messina will be discussing how you can use chat apps and bots for business communications. Um, Chris is best known as the inventor of the hashtag, but he has also done stints at Google and Uber. Um, he has spoken at conferences like South by Southwest, Web 2.0 Expo, Google I.O. and LaunchFest, and has frequently been quoted in media outlets such as the New York Times, Business Week, the Los Angeles Times, Washington Post, and Wired. Chris has his own chatbot, Messina Bot, that manages his schedule and helps people get in touch with him. Um, and just before we get, we get started, just some housekeeping. Um, we'd love to hear from you and answer any questions that you may have. So um, please go to the control panel on your right and ask any questions that you have, and Chris will be able to man answer those by the uh, end of the show. Great. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, it is, let's see, great, hold on a second, there's my mouse, okay, let's take this way, share my screen, and let's hopefully this is doing the right one. Okay, I think we're good. Um, I can, let's see, all right, I gotta minimize this go to meeting thing, okay, great. Uh, it's not like it's amateur hour or something here. Anyways, um, hey guys, um, my name is Chris Messina, um, and Jeff already kind of like introduced me, but you guys might know me as the guy that kind of, oh, that's that's a typo, that's embarrassing. I brought the, uh, we're going to do this live, okay guys, um, brought the hashtag to Twitter 10 years ago, so it's been a while. Um, if you follow me on Product Hunt, you know I'm prolific. Um, I, some, uh, I have some kind of a problem or addiction there. Um, I'm working on it. Um, and I've, I've been in a bunch of news media, uh, and I've spoken at a bunch of conferences and stuff. And so I'm sort of off on my own doing something new, which I haven't announced yet. Um, but you can imagine that it might be in this space, given uh, how interested I am in it. Um, as Jeff also said, you know, make sure that you ask questions. Um, there'll be some time at the end. Um, I'll be talking for probably about a half an hour or so, and then I'll, I'll be getting to those questions then. Um, and do you know, be sure to take the poll. Um, just to give you kind of like a high level sense of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, this is actually going to be a fairly high level um, talk, um, kind of just introducing you to why things are happening the way they are, how we got here, um, and some samples of kind of what I've seen in the space. Um, and then again, with the, the Q&A at the end, I think we can go a little bit deeper on some specific questions. Um, so one question that you guys might have brought, depending on if you've already built a bot or are here, um, you know, because of that is whether or not you should actually build a bot. And I'm sorry to say I can't give you an answer to that. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that bots are kind of this um, great new emergent interface for connecting to your customers through voice and messaging. Um, and I'm going to walk you through how we kind of got here and why bots, you know, on the one hand, we're all the rage in 2016, um, but now we're sort of wallowing in the trough of sorrow, uh, waiting for some great breakout success. Um, essentially, uh, last January, I wrote a post on Medium um, declaring that 2016 was going to be the year of conversational commerce. And this post had kind of been, you know, percolating in my mind for a while. And I, I'd actually written a post the year before um, thinking about this topic in a very kind of loose way because I'd, I'd been observing um, apps coming out like Fetch and Path Talk that we're trying to use SMS and messaging as a channel to connect customers to businesses. And in December of 2015, um, the messenger team and Uber worked together to essentially integrate the ability to request a ride during the course of a chat conversation. And you know, observing the industry as I had been and seeing that integration suggested to me that we are on the verge of perhaps a new uh, platform opportunity, if not a new platform war. Um, and so the, the broad trend, as I kind of understood it, was that we're going to start using chat, messaging, and other natural language interfaces, for example, voice, to not only interact with you know, our friends and family members, but also brands, services, and kind of automated systems that we call bots that really didn't exist 
in a bi-directional asynchronous messaging context before. In other words, in order to interact with you know, brands and companies previously, you usually have to go to a website, and that website was one directional. Uh, furthermore, if you would you know, sort of get in touch with customer service, you'd kind of have a conversation over email or over some kind of web forum or customer service system, um, as opposed to having a more real-time conversation. Of course, you could call, um, but increasingly people were doing that less. So that was sort of like the pretext here. Um, now, my explanation was a bit wordy. Mary Meeker um, from Kleiner Perkins, I think, said it a little more simply in her report that we are starting to evolve from simple social conversations, kind of using you know, social media, to business-related conversations um, and conversations with businesses. Now, what I hadn't anticipated when I wrote this post was the kind of popular response. Um, and over the course of 2016, I was invited to speak at a number of different events about how conversations, which is a, obviously a very a critical, central, fundamental human interaction, were starting to become uh, greater than the sum of their parts um, by virtue of incorporating additional technology. And there are a couple motivations for this. Um, this is a slide actually from a friend of mine, Rup Luke Robluski, who's at Google, um, and it points out how over the last 10 years, there's been an enormous shift away from PCs. You can see like the gray line there in the background. You know, essentially PC sales are flat. Whereas in the same time, um, you know, smartphone and tablet sales have jumped, you know, from 68 million to 1,729 million. Like that's just enormous. So essentially the environment is being saturated with these devices. And with those devices comes a new type of behavior. And that new type of behavior I think was best evidenced I'm sure you guys have seen this slide before, or, or it's been out there um, from, from Business uh, Insider, where messaging is actually starting to eclipse conventional feed-based social networking apps. So essentially, people are using these devices that are now all over the market um, to communicate, to communicate with each other, with their friends, with other people, to coordinate. You know, that sort of makes sense. But as a result of all of that behavior and the centrality of that use case, now we're starting to see a lot of companies shift to bring their services to that context. Now there's also something that is important about 2016. Um, you know, a couple years ago, Facebook split out Messenger from what they call the blue app. Um, and you know, it was controversial at the time, but that strategy seems to have paid off as people are moving to adopt Messenger as a primary means of communication. Um, and this includes young people. You know, teenagers and millennial, millennials uh, specifically are both using Messenger and are interested in using chat as a modality for interacting with uh, brands and services. I think it's also, of course, contextually relevant that um, the re one of the reasons why these Messenger platforms like WhatsApp and Messenger and, and Kick and Viber and, and the rest are popular is because they've drastically undercut the cost of communication that used to be very expensive over SMS and phone calls. So by using internet telephony um, and internet messaging, you can essentially offer that functionality for free as an over-the-top service that um, disrupts a lot of the conventional telcos. Um, and so I think that's, that's driving a lot of this migration. You know, whenever there's sort of things that are free or freer, um, people tend to move in that direction. And so you know, the other thing that we're seeing, um, and this is research from Ubisend, um, you know, roughly 64% of people, you know, agree that businesses really should be available and uh, contactable via messaging apps. So it's not just enough to kind of put a web chat form on your website. People are going into the context of a messaging service um, and looking for a brand. And if they don't find it, or they find, for example, some other brand um, or some fake brand, they're going to interact with that, and that might be very confusing for them. Um, and additionally, almost. 50% of people are split as to whether they prefer to call or message um, a business. And I imagine that the number is going to in increase as more and more businesses move to the messaging platforms and actually offer native capabilities. In other words, right now, my expectations for messaging any kind of, especially like local business, is very, very low. I don't expect to get a great experience. You know, I expect most of them to sort of, you know, be like the phone call that we used to make that just kind of rang and rang and no one would pick up. Um, I think as more companies get wise to the fact that people want to communicate with brands through this channel, we'll see this number increase. 
So I'm going to take you back uh, kind of like on a longer journey to get to where we are because I think that when I look at these trends, and, and again, when I sort of think about the transition that happened 10 years ago when I was contemplating how to create groups on Twitter, you know, to make Twitter more topical and relevant to people, um, we were shifting from a desktop computing era to a mobile computing era. And so at the time, a lot of people had proposed a way of solving the groups problem on Twitter by just using kind of conventional web forums, you know, kind of Reddit style groups, um, you know, where there's admins and managers and stuff like that. But to me, it seemed like we were moving to a world where uh, you wanted to be on the go and constantly connected and you needed very simple ways of kind of, you know, labeling your conversations. And so you needed a new kind of thinking um, and a new way of getting there. And that shift was part of a broader sh shift overall uh, that I'd like to walk you through right now. So if we go all the way back, I mean, this is, you know, usually when I, when I think about uh, the origin of, of the Internet and technology, uh, I go back to the 60s and the Cold War. But I'm going to jump ahead a little bit um, to, uh, you know, the era of, of Windows. And I'm sure you guys recognize this stud. Um, this is Bill Gates. Um, what's interesting about what he was, you know, essentially offering the world, I mean, you can sort of see the, the PC in the background there, was a way of taking conceptually this context in other words, the office environment, um, where it was very sort of regimented and orderly, and you know there were, I, I mean, the, the language of Windows. I mean, it's it's so interesting. Um, derives directly from from this world. In other words, you had sort of you know program groups, you know teams of people. You had executables, which were sort of like executives. Um, you know, you had uh, files and folders, as you can see, you know, in this in environment. And these are all you know virtual language and labels that were applied to these digital concepts. And so that world, you know, this world uh, of, of computers was, was designed to sort of fit into a corporate environment where there were fairly advanced users who were motivated, of course, because this was their livelihood, um, to use these computers, right? So you sort of expected to sort of sit in front of this thing all day and like type away um, and get your work done. Now, things started to shift a little bit uh, with the advent of um, you know Windows 95, uh, they started to add in you know gradients and full color resolution and screen savers and stuff like that um, to usher in kind of like the the the, the era era prior to truly personal computing. Um, so the thought in this moment was that everyone might have a workstation at home and maybe you'd use it for some you know media and interactive games. Um, but mostly, given the cost and given um, the performance of these machines, they weren't really designed for individual use, um, at least in terms of truly personal, this is my device and I'm going to take it everywhere I go with me. Um, that really didn't happen until 2007 when, of course, Steve Jobs uh, announced and Apple announced the iPhone. Now, uh, there's a great clip, actually, if you go back and you watch the, the unveiling of the iPhone, um, it's, it's really incredible to kind of just sort of see both the vision and the clarity of what this device was and what it meant. But I'm going to walk you through a few pieces because this is showing the transition from the previous era of computing into the mobile generation um, and furthermore into a more casual generation of computing. So essentially when he introduced the iPhone, he was looking at the existing set of devices. And most of the phones back then were considered to be, you know, not too smart and pretty hard to use, um, and you know, pretty unreliable overall. And so the iPhone was designed to be a very personal device, uh, a very intimate device that you had a, a, a true relationship with, and it was designed to be smart and easy to use. And when he addressed the kind of failure state of all these previous generation cell phones, you know, what he found or what he pointed out rather, was that the 30% or so of these devices, essentially these physical keyboards, um, meant that these devices really um, were not accessible to a broad number of people. And furthermore, were less useful for a broad range of applications because of course you had the same set of keys regardless of the application. And so the fact that these were fixed in plastic uh, meant that the computing apparatus, you know, you sort of perceived it as 
an extension of the, the previous era of the PC. And so the way that he solved it, of course, was to propose a pointing device you know, and a graphical user interface. But when it comes to mobile, you don't really want to like lug around a mouse. That doesn't make sense. And so the question is, well, how do you enable people to directly manipulate this environment? Well, at the time, of course, lots of people thought that a stylus would be a great solution. Um, but I think as Jobs correctly pointed out, no one really wants a stylus. You know, you lose it. Um, it, it doesn't really work that well. It's kind of clunky. Um, you have to find it. It's just, it's, it's annoying, you know, to have this additional element in the mix. And so what he proposed was something rather obviously novel at the time, which was to use something that all of us have, in fact, we have 10 of them, to use touch. And touch, of course, and the way that it was designed and developed, first of all, just worked. It was very accurate. And it was very, I think, most importantly, accessible. So you sort of started migrating from this office-driven, expert-led world to one of touch, which meant that more and more people, without any training whatsoever, could actually get into computing. And as a result, you know, I don't know if you've seen any of these videos, but you can search for them on YouTube. Uh, you know, babies, infants, can operate an iPad. <clears throat> and you can see that on the left here, actually, in this, in this video, the baby's swiping through screens and home screens and, and seems to get it. Whereas when that same baby is interacting with a magazine, attempting to do pinch to zoom, it doesn't work. Uh, and so there's this natural element uh, of, of touch that made computing suddenly accessible to a lot more people. Now, the other thing is that the iPhone brought together an entertainment device, a phone for communication, and an extensibility model through iOS and the availability of apps. But what Apple really didn't do, or at least left room for, um, and I think this was you know, fairly significant, was uh, to basically add in social. And so in 2008, this is essentially when um, you know, Facebook kind of took on the world um, and leapt from the college and university setting into the real world. And the way that Facebook did that was by, again, making simpler the interaction model of computing. So before, as opposed to being very explicit about everything, you just tapped all these buttons. And these buttons would slowly build up this um, you know, graph of your interest and so on. And as a result, again, of making computing simpler, Facebook's number of active users over the last, say, nine years has obviously exploded. And this is huge. And the thing that's you know, most interesting about this is not the two billion users that Facebook has now. It's that there's a whole lot of the world that is not online yet and is going to get online in the next, let's say, 10 years. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, which is all part of what this conversation is about, is what the computing devices of the future are going to look like. Are they going to look more like the PC that we've known and you know, require expertise to operate them? You have to like know English, for example, to operate a keyboard? Or are they going to be more voice-driven and messaging-driven? And I think you can understand my bias. So it's impossible to kind of have this conversation without mentioning the movie Her. This device is sort of designed as a future uh, companion, I suppose, with an operating system um, that in this case is, is known as Samantha. And um, you know, without trying to give it too much away, in this case, the main character, uh, Theodore Twombly, has this relationship that develops with his operating system, with this AI that lives in the cloud. And so a lot of people think about uh, this model when they think about where we're going you know, with bots and messaging. But that's the kind of future that is, you know, if not dozens of years away, uh, even longer, because general AI, as it's known, uh, is, is going to be very difficult to get to. Um, however, when people are skeptical about, you know, AI and bots, I think what's important, you know, as I showed with like the toddler example, is to think about the way that children experience these platforms and devices. And so, if any of you have kids or nieces and nephews or um, you know, you just watch popular media and you see children interact with these computing systems, they find it very natural. So in this case, uh, this is a scene from the movie Her where Theodore is talking to his goddaughter, I believe, and Samantha, of course, this AI that lives in the cloud, 
bought this dress for her. And of course she's wearing it, she's very excited. And the crazy thing is that Theodore introduces Samantha through this device that she's holding. And um, Samantha talks to uh, this is his goddaughter and um, essentially talks back and interacts with this character as though it's completely normal. So, you know, if you've ever done FaceTime with children, you sort of can see how this disembodied um, experience isn't that unusual for them. We tell them that it's normal, it's a person on the other side, and suddenly they, they believe it's real. And I see this at home, um, you know, with my, my two kids, like they talk to Alexa and Siri constantly, and they have a great deal of, you know, uh, respect and, and have developed quite a relationship with her. And that's normal. And this is the first, you know, couple years when these products are out. So you can only imagine how this is going to change over time. So to kind of spell this out and put this into kind of like what's happening at the macro level and how these macro trends are giving us the ability to have new assumptions. Um, we've seen a massive shift towards design. And during my time at Google, um, Google really shifted from being an engineering-led culture to one that really brought design into the mix. Um, and I think it's led the way largely through Android and material design and things like that. Um, we've also seen uh, the friction and access cost of the internet go down. The speed of computing has gone up, making it more pleasant and enjoyable to use. There's, of course, more people online. And in fact, uh, there's fewer and fewer people who I would say are offline for any given amount of time. Um, we're using technology in all facets of our day, you know, from the home to the car to work. Um, so it's no longer just isolated to, again, like the work environment. And that's leading to having a more casual and familiar relationship with all this technology. And as a result of that relationship, we're starting to be willing to invite these assistants into our lives. You know, we're kind of actually you know, requiring that we have some help to deal with all these connections that we have. And um, what this means is that our kids are starting to observe and model their behavior after what they're observing in us. And so to me, uh, when I think about the voice and messaging space, I'm watching children like very closely to kind of get a sense for what the new normal um, might look like. Now, if you want to also get a sense for some of this, there's this great post um, that um, the Google design team put out uh, called No Such Thing as Offline. You can see the URL there. Um, but if you just search for digital natives um, in Google design, you'll find it. Um, but it kind of gives you, again, kind of like an overview of, of these macro shifts that are happening and how people's expectations about their connectivity is changing. And all this is to kind of, you know, put this together and to say that a lot of the big companies are getting it. And specifically, um, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, you know, declared last year that bots are the new apps and shifted the entire company to be focused on conversations as a platform. And I think that's huge. So before I go any further, I want to just very quickly go through some terms um, so that we're all kind of speaking the same language. Um, you know, obviously AI is kind of a big term. This is kind of like a, a, a term of art. It's a field of computer science where machines start to mimic cognitive functions, in other words, the way that people think. Machine learning is the ability for computers to sort of learn without explicit programming. In other words, they kind of go through and look at you know, two different things, make a comparison, decide, and then that reinforces their decision tree in, into the future. Um, and in a similar way, a neural network labels all those nodes and connections and ranks them or stacks them to be able to make sense uh, and to use this as a kind of filter over data that might be submitted later on. And then Deep learning, uh, similarly, kind of takes all that stuff and just does a lot of trial and error until you hone an algorithm to be able to provide you with the outcomes that you'd expect. Um, and then there's a whole generation of um, technologies around natural language processing, understanding, and generation, which is really about helping computers to interact with, in this case, or mostly humans, using natural or familiar language. Um, Additionally, there's some confusion around what a bot is. A bot is primarily just an autonomous program on a network. So in other words, it's kind of connected, it's sitting there, and it does stuff for you. Um, you put some stuff in, it sends some stuff back out. A chatbot, on the other hand, I think this is where there's some confusion, uh, typically uses human language um, to kind of have a conversation with you, whether it makes sense or not is you know, besides the point. An AI assistant is essentially a bot that performs tasks or services for an individual. And a skill is essentially a capability that an AI assistant can learn or obtain um, through a number of different methods. And then finally, we have um, the bot platform, which is, of course, a computing context where bots can live, and then a voice platform, which is, of course, 
a, a platform um, that has a voice interface that can be extended uh, by third-party skills or bots. Um, when I've talked to the Facebook Messenger team, and, and this talk you know, does focus a lot on Messenger because that's the one that I'm both most familiar with and seems to have the largest um, spread, um, they're primarily focused on four different categories. So branded bots are a big category for them, news and news media, um, you know, and I'll show you some examples of these um, later. Um, and then customer service is obviously one that, that I've seen a bunch, and, and that's usually with a human in the loop. Um, in other words, there's a human kind of staffing that part um, of the experience. And then commerce. So there are actually brands um, like Hypebeast and others that are actually selling products through the messaging context. And then the enterprise you know, space, specifically in Slack, if you go through their, their app directory, a lot of the bots there are about looking up information um, from within an organization, helping out with internal operations. So for example, HR um, you know, can put a lot of processes online, or you can look up information about your peers, or you can like order lunch you know, as a team. Um, and then workflow automation, you know, pretty straightforward. You've got kind of, you pipe together a bunch of different bots as information you know, units, and they kind of talk together. And then, of course, customer service or support again, where you're taking those front end channels in messaging and then piping it into threads um, in Slack and then doing customer service in that way. So um, let's talk about some of the challenges of conversational UI. Um, one of them is immediacy. So unless you actually respond quickly, in other words, within 20 to 30 seconds, people are going to get frustrated and they're going to leave. So this creates a huge um, operational burden because you need to be able to staff up or you need to be able to automate in order to cope with whatever scale of users you may actually be interacting with. Um, and as it turns out, typically in a, in a call center or context like that, um, operators can deal with probably about three concurrent conversations at a time before they start to get distracted and actually erode the experience um, from the customer side. Um, another problem, of course, is you know when you go to those web chat uh, you know things on a website and they're like, sorry, we're not open right now. Like that's a pretty bad experience. And again, people have an immediate need and they're sort of expecting resolution. And if you can't find a way to facilitate those conversations and to get them a resolution either through a self-serve process um, or by having just you know constant around the clock um, you know operator standing by, so to speak, um, you may miss out actually on that on that business. Um, and in conventional chat, spe specifically on the web and in the web browser, you lose context. In other words, when I close the browser, um, you know, I, I may lose access to that agent, or I may lose access to my chat log. Um, there are some services, of course, that will offer to email it to you, but in the context of a messaging app, you always have that persistent uh, storage over time. Um, and then the other problem is that a lot of these chats are isolated from each other. So I may have sent an email request in, to get service, but uh, the chat agent that I'm talking to on the website doesn't know about it. And so how do you sort of weave all these different contexts together so that the customer feels like you understand them as a person as opposed to a bunch of different rows in a database that are not connected? Now, at the same time, there are a number of benefits um, to the conversational UI platforms. One is, on the inverse, immediacy for the user. So in the everything on demand generation, you know, I've got a problem, I need it to be solved, solve my problem. Um, that's kind of what your customer is coming to you with, and you need to be able to turn around very quickly. Um, and with messaging, you can do that. Um, the conversation is also authentic. So the customer can actually express their problem in their own language, as opposed to trying to hunt down something on your sitemap. And of course, this is a two-way communication channel, as opposed to a kind of, you know, do not reply email address um, that I'm sure frustrates thousands of people you know, every minute. Um, and you can create a hybrid solution where on the one hand, you are providing an automated response that says, hey, you know, here are some common ways to solve the password problem. Let's say you, know, you forgot your password, do these things. Um, but if that doesn't resolve the problem, then you can fall back to a human um, or escalate to a human. And additionally, in the messaging space, you can sort of combine the, the information that you have about the person or their profile or their account with the information that you've stored to get a better 360 view of them, um, presuming they've authenticated or demonstrated you know, who they are in some way to you. Um, and the fact that most users already have messaging apps installed mean that there's nothing additional for them to install. 
Um, they can just contact you through whatever platform they prefer, and you can interact with them directly. Um, and, and I think this is actually a really big one, and this builds on all the things that I was saying before about how computing is becoming easier to use and more casual. Um, I think one of the big barriers to actually gaining you know, long-term customers is that if they have to install your app and then get in touch with you, they have to go through whatever uh, support system you've set up or learn your interface to get there. And that's a lot of friction relative to what they already know in the messaging apps that they use. Um, so I think it's very important to, to think about that and maybe in addition to having your native app, provide support through a messaging context so that people don't have to learn um, anything to, to be in touch with you. Now I'm just going to go quickly through kind of like the new platforms um, as they exist now. Um, this sort of happened over last year where just you know dozens of these platforms launched and now we have even more. Um, and so this is roughly kind of a breakdown um, and, and many of these logos should be familiar to you. But the point is there's a lot of choice out there um, now and depending on where your customers are, who they are and what they do, um, you may want to choose to use different platforms accordingly. Um, the good news is though, there's a lot of tools um, that are being created, kind of the, the picks and shovels, if you will, of this generation. Um, and a lot of these providers are making it easier for you to build for one platform or many platforms to automate and connect to your existing CRM services and systems. Um, and they're relatively diverse in terms of the sophistication that you need to be able to take advantage of them. In other words, some require you to do some coding and others do not. So again, based on your needs and your sophistication, there's probably a product out there for you. Um, and just to kind of look at this you know, quickly, um, the way that, that bots are kind of set up today uh, is that you have obviously your sort of like chat conversation um, and you've got content, you've got some action buttons, you've got quick replies. Essentially, you know, the system is keeping track of the conversation and when certain words are triggered or when a button is pushed in the co course of a conversation, um, the platform will actually respond with whatever it is that you've chosen um, you know, in, the, in, the, in the context of a quick reply. Um, you can use rich media. There's oftentimes a persistent menu, and Facebook's been making a lot of changes in that regard lately. Um, and then in, in, in apps like Telegram um, and Kick, you can have uh, like keyboards that are actually provided to the user um, so they can re reply in a structured way. Um, now, like I mentioned before, one of the things that I think is really significant about the, the messaging space is that you have this historical record of a conversation. So from a user's perspective, they can always go back and see what they talked about before and remember, whereas the web, of course, has this page model where you sort of hop from one place to the next to the next and you lose a lot of context in between. And when you close the browser, you know, depending on what kind of system you're on, if you're on like a public computer, then, then you lose all of your history. Um, and so that loss of memory, I think, is actually problematic for building these long-term relationships with people. Um, very quickly, I'm going to go through kind of like the landscape, give you guys some examples, and we'll open, open up for questions. Um, so you're probably familiar with a lot of these AI assistants. There's Google for Google Assistant, there's Cortana, Siri, there's a new one from Samsung called Bixby, which previously was called Viv. And so that's going to be available on a lot of Samsung devices, and I think it's interesting because they're doing a cross uh, modality solution. In other words, um, if you talk to Bixby, let's say through your TV, your Samsung TV, uh, it may respond to you by sending you a screen through your phone. And so that sort of you know, closed loop is very interesting. Um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Alexa. Amazon is pushing that really hard. And then there's a few other independent ones, and one of them um, in this case is called Oslo. Um, so you can sort of just see kind of like what's out there. Um, in the case of chatbots, as I said, these are kind of bots that you just have a conversation with. Literally, you just talk to it and it talks back to you. And it's using a lot of NLP, um, NLU, and NLG to construct these conversations. And they're largely targeted at a younger uh, audience, um, which I think are you know, more forgiving of strangeness. Um, there are, of course, bots, uh, in this case, uh, for shopping. And Operator is actually a hybrid where you are paired with kind of an expert. Trunk Club is the same way. You're paired with an expert who goes out and curates stuff for you and then gives you recommendations and you conduct the whole transaction through this conversational flow. So it's, it's a little bit different than the conventional Amazon style, you know, browse and buy. Um, and this is good when you may not know exactly what you're looking for, but you have an idea of the category that you want to shop in and you need some expertise. 
Um, I just wanted to point out, this is in the travel space. Um, onboarding is incredibly important. Um, uh, you know, in this case, if you, this is a snap travel, you can see the description of the app um, on the far left. You can see that Facebook identifies it as typically replying instantly. And so that's a really important element. Um, and they do that, of course, through their you know, bot automation service. What I think they've done well here is that the first thing that you do when you come in here is that they actually give you an overview of the service and they give you a sense for what is possible. I find that a lot of bots that you come to don't do a good job um, of explaining what is possible with a bot. And so people are left kind of like wondering, like, what do I do with this? And I think this is leading to a lot of people feeling frustrated and feeling that bots suck because they have no idea what they're you know, capable of. Um, there's a lot of bots out there, obviously, in the news space. Some are better than others. Um, I think that you know, there's been, there was a big experiment happening um, you know, out of F8 last year to kind of move a lot of publishers and to use the messaging channel as a new notification channel. And I actually find that it's, it's pretty useful. You know, there's, no, there's no ads in this context right now. Um, and you know, getting my news this way is, is, is fast and it's efficient. Um, so it's worth sort of experimenting with that, especially if you're doing any content marketing. How can you deliver useful, relevant information to people based on topics that they might actually be interested in? Um, and how do you build that personal relationship where someone might actually reach out and get in touch with you as a result of a story that they've read? There's a lot of awesome stuff being done by Pullstring. Uh, and unfortunately, Persona Synthetics uh, has been shut down, but essentially they created this whole character story that you would interact with. Um, and the Call of Duty bot, I think, is still up. Um, you essentially are booking a flight, an intergalactic flight, um, and you, you kind of, I won't spoil it too much, but keep dying uh, in the process. Definitely worth checking out. There are bots as well for the basics, you know, ordering beer and pizza. Um, Domino's has been doing a lot in this space. Um, definitely worth seeing and checking out what they're doing, especially with um, the pizza emoji on Twitter. There's a lot of music discovery services out there. One of them that I found pretty cool is called Lazy Set. And I think what's interesting about Lazy Set is that you essentially give it a list of artists that you're interested in, and it generates a Spotify playlist for you. So also keep in mind that bots can actually integrate with third-party services and use that third-party data to enrich their service. RecordBird similarly allows you to connect to your you know, Spotify account and then pull in bands that you might be interested in and learning about new records as they come out. Um, there's bots out there that do computer art, computer-generated stuff. You sort of send it a selfie, and it like kind of like does some weird stuff. Um, and then there's a bunch of celebrities that are toying with using messaging as a distribution platform. And I haven't found any that are you know incredible yet, but um, I have a bot, so that says something, right? Um, and I guess you know before I wrap, um, there are some resources out there that are on the web. Um, I didn't want to like dump them all in here because I kind of curate this stuff constantly. One um, is a service that I use called Refind. And if you, you can see the URL up the top there, refind.com slash chrismcina. You can search within all these links. I don't know if you guys remember Delicious, um, but it's sort of like a modern day equivalent of Delicious or maybe a little bit like Pocket. Um, I just like gather all these resources and put them there. Um, and if you want to invite, just send a message via my bot, um, which is on Messenger, and I'll, I'll hook you up. Um, and then, of course, on Product Hunt, I collect a lot of stuff. Um, and so you can follow me there. And I've got a couple collections that are related to bots and conversational commerce. So anyways, um, with that, I want to thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to open up to questions. So I'm going to pop out of my presentation here. Though I have one more thing to do. <laughs> and pop over to my this thing here. OK. Great. So let's see. OK. Uh... Great insights, Chris. Thank you. Um, it's funny, in interesting enough, I was watching my daughter play with my cell phone this morning, and, and uh, or smartphone this morning, and realizing that she's mimicking everything mar her mom and dad do. So uh, that, that kind of part hit home for me. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we did actually get a handful of questions for you here. Um, just like to start with um, one from Yanni. Is, um, isn't chatbot just another variation of I IVR, either DTMF or speech recognition based? Um, it is, and there's a lot I think to be learned from uh, you know these voice systems that have existed in the past. I think the difference and the new opportunity really is um, to use machine learning and AI to be more responsive on different contexts and platforms. So before, of course, you had to sort of call in 
um, and go through these big tree structures. And that's fine, but that may not be the way that someone actually prefers to get in touch with you. So you know, you can start with IVR, um, maybe as a way of learning the domain and kind of what's, what's possible, but um, I think this new world is pushing people into a more casual way of interacting with brands and services. Like, you know, doing, I don't know how you would do emoji over IVR, but like, you know, that's the kind of, you know, one of the elements that I think you should be thinking about bringing to, um, you know, the conversational context. Right, good call. Um, oh, excellent. So, um, Akeem asks, uh, well, he says he's, he's really looking forward to seeing what uh, WhatsApp, uh, when WhatsApp inc incorporates bots, thinks, he thinks it'll be a game changer as, um, Every, pretty much everybody uses WhatsApp now. Um, so, what what are your thoughts on that? WhatsApp WhatsApp incorporating bots? Yeah. So, I mean, this is a super interesting question, and in fact, it's one of the ones that I was asking last year. Um, I thought that WhatsApp, you know, given its scale, um, that, I mean, let, let, let's put this in context. You know, first, you know, Facebook bought WhatsApp, you know, very smartly, um, sort of before a lot of this this hype happened, seeing that this was the way that people were, you know, getting online and connecting. Um, in some ways, I thought that Messenger would have been their test bed for trying out bots and businesses that would have been extended over to the WhatsApp platform. But what I've learned in the conversations that I've had with people is that the way that WhatsApp is actually engineered, uh, namely from a security and encryption perspective, is that it's actually not easy for them to incorporate bots onto the platform because mm -hmm. WhatsApp never has access to the, the text chats. So this creates a, a pretty interesting predicament um, where the security design of the platform, you know, kind of like Signal or other messengers, um, prevent it from having third parties uh, be able to integrate directly uh, into those those conversations. Oh, never thought about that. <laughs> Thanks. Good, good call. Right. <laughs> um, Oops. <Yeah>. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so uh, Kevin for, uh, asks, um, so could we teach uh, machines programming languages and just ask them to create software based on our voice and visual inputs and design el elements at some point in the future? Um, yeah, so in some ways, I mean, there's two ways to answer this. One, there is a lot of software that's already writing itself. Um, and in fact, Viv, which Samsung acquired, and um, you know, it's now the underlying technology behind Bixby does that. Essentially, it has a number of generative routines that when you make a request and there's an intent that's identified, that intent maps to a set of uh, scripts, essentially, that then write themselves automatically based on the user's you know, needs or preferences. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say in terms of creating kind of you know, personal bots that represent ourselves, we're still a long ways off from that actually happening. Um, but for sure, just as you've trained Google with your preferences, um, and as you've trained, you know, Inbox uh, with the people that you actually want to talk to, and then all the rest kind of gets filtered out. Um, that's happening already. It just might not look the way that we expect it to. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, so Oizen asks, um, do you not think that you, the user has acclimatized to the asynchronicity of messaging, and therefore is okay with businesses not responding instantaneously? Um, so, for example, if you're interacting with your friends, sometimes you message, you don't hear back for eight hours or so, and that's okay. Um, do you see that uh, being an expectation for friend, uh, for businesses as well? Yeah, and it's absolutely, I think, a, a great question. Um, and it's particularly a good question because it, it sort of highlights the, the element of, of context and understanding your customer and what your customer's needs are. Um, I wouldn't, you know, assert that all businesses need to be immediately responsive and need to staff up, you know, these huge call centers if they have uh, customers that, one, sort of understand, like, this is, you know, a local business and these are the hours that it's operational. Um, but I do think that in terms of the responsiveness, the way to think about it is, you know, what are the set of questions that most customers have, especially, like, like there's a really good example um, in the banking world. So. Um, banks typically have terrible hours during the day. You know, bankers' hours are notoriously very brief and short, and they're during the time when everyone else is working. So mm -hmm. it would make sense, you know, during the day to essentially staff, you know, a, a banking messaging, you know, uh, service with people because that's when they're working. But then immediately when those bankers go home or whatever, um, to sort of shift into the automated mode, and then to provide uh, clear communication about when you'll receive a, a response back, and, and ideally over which platforms. Mm. Right. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, 
What, uh, Chris asks actually, um, so are you aware of any examples or case studies of businesses using chatbots internally? So for example, to uh, reach their, their employees? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, obviously Slack is, is kind of like the forefront um, of that, but um, you know, I, actually there, there's a couple ways of thinking about this. Um, you know, this, this may be a little too much insider baseball, but um, you know, when I was at Uber, for whatever reason, um, I won't get into it, we didn't use Slack. And so um, we kind of used the things that were necessary to get our jobs done. And one of the things that we used was Telegram. And on Telegram, you know, because it's an open platform, you could actually build um, you know, bots to sort of manage your own team and deploy them for use of your own team and restrict the users that have access to them. Um, so in that sense, when you think about it perhaps a little differently, it's like what are the things that we'd like to be able to either automate or help facilitate in terms of communication internally that a bot could help us with. So, you know, whether it's like customer service or in our case, you know, the developer platform, you know, whenever someone submits a bug on our website, we get pinged over Telegram. Um, that could be a really useful way of actually kind of keeping the team, um, especially in a, in a group context or a group channel, um, apprised of things that are going on. So, um, yes, it's absolutely happening. Cool. Um, and just as we're, we're, we're running out of time now, I'll just uh, go one last question. Um, so this is from John. Um, what changes do you see happening within organizations in order to manage this new channel? So um, are, are, are organizations now prepared to manage uh, bots and, and, and chat apps or are there things that they need to do to actually be able to manage this properly? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, and I, I, I feel like I don't have sufficient insights into a broad set of companies, but what I will say is this. Um, we've gone through this type of you know, shift in the past, uh, especially when it came to social media. You know, there was a time where I think brands were wondering, well, do I just need to sort of like listen in, you know, to what's going on in social media about my brand and then not engage? And I think over time, brands have realized that actually engaging in a principled way, in a way that adds value and is, um, you know, kind of consistent with the messaging of the company is actually a good thing. So on the one hand, there's probably already, um, a content, uh, if not content marketing, you know, playbook or um, a, a content strategy that you could sort of like just expand to include and incorporate, you know, messaging in this kind of context. Um, but I do think that a lot of it starts with understanding what kind of service you want to provide and whether conversation is core to the product that you're building um, or whether it's, you know, an adjunct or auxiliary. Um, and again, to sort of tap into what the expectations of your customers are. And the easiest way to do that, of course, is just to ask them. Um, so I do think that companies are starting to shift to this opportunity, albeit slowly, because they're kind of like, is there a there there? Um, but I do think that those companies that sort of you know, get out in front of this, realize the service potential that's there, and um, open up these bi-directional channels, which again, in the email context, it's usually one way. Um, I imagine that you'll actually drive a lot more loyalty um, because people will feel like you're a lot more accessible to them in a channel that they uh, feel comfortable in. So it sounds it sounds to me like it's not as much of a technological thing, but more of a um, kind of an organizational um, process management to to be able to actually really truly be met, uh, ready for this new channel. That, yeah, I would I would definitely agree with that. And again, the way that I think about this is to think about conversational products as uh, a combination of service and product itself, the thing that you bring to market, and that. A good customer relationship is one that unfolds over over a long term or over a long period of time. And so, if you orient to that, then you realize that conversational context is an amazingly efficient um, way of actually delivering that kind of next level, next gen service. And yes, it does have to start from a higher level of strategy as opposed to saying, "Well, you know, let's put the intern on it," you know, because that's not going to work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Very true. Um, well, excellent. Uh, think, thanks again, Chris. I mean, this is some, like I said, just great insight for us, um, and I'm sure our, our listeners are, are appreciate it immensely. Um, so I guess uh, in, in that way, we'd just like to wrap up for the day, and uh, um, yeah, thanks. So I'll just a qu quick outro, and, and that's it. So um, for everybody listening at home, uh, thank you very much for coming. Coming. I hope you learned as much as I did. Um, just as an outro, uh, just a little bit about um, a little bit about Infobip. Uh, basically, Infobip helps uh, businesses connect with their consumers through mobile channels such as SMS, voice, chat, push, and email. Founded in 2006 and headquartered in London, UK, Infobip has over 50 offices and 1,000 employees around the world. 
Um, as, some of the, as one of the pioneers in the application to person space, InfoVip has forged deep partnerships in the telecommunications industry, including supplying hardware critical to carriers being able to manage and monetize A2B traffic. Our omnichannel communications platform unites SMS, email, chat, voice, and push notifications together into a seamless experience. It allows companies to scale up from using just a single communication channel to five without significant, adding significant um, IT resources. Um, this global communications platform is the largest of its kind around the world and is supported by a team of over 150 developers and 24-7 support in 10 languages in any country around the world. Um, so before I go, uh, our next webinar will be held on May 17th with customer experience expert and Altimeter Group Analyst Brian Solis. Um, so watch our website uh, for, for more. Thank you very much.